Hello to everyone out there. Uh, today, we're going to be giving a presentation on how Airflow has been at the core of our data science platform here at Sony PlayStation. Uh, first of all, a little bit about who we are. Um, so here's um, a quick background on us presenters. Um, I'm uh, Siraj Malik. I'm an engineering manager here for the data science platform team within the data strategy and operations org. Uh, I've been at PlayStation a little over five years. Uh, I was originally hired as an engineer. Um, a lot of my early work here at PlayStation was around introducing, socializing Airflow, um, and then also doing um, a lot of the development work and building out tools to support it. Uh, the second pres presenter is going to be Ahmed Saljuginijad. Uh, he is a senior engineer on our team. Uh, he's been on the team around two and a half years now. Uh, he was brought in to help us, especially um, with respect to migrating our platform into Kubernetes. Uh, he's played an instrumental role in helping provide a Kubernetes native vision of Airflow for us. And he's also been responsible um, in kind of leading and building out a lot of the new Kubernetes-based tooling um, that we use on our platform. Uh, so here's the agenda um, for the presentation. Uh, the first couple of bullet points we'll try to keep kind of quick, uh, saving more time for the gist of the presentation. Um, first, we'll start off by um, touching on a bit about our team. Um, then we'll give you guys a brief history of Airflow at PlayStation, um, show you guys our initial setup uh, and usage, and then discuss some of the limitations with that initial approach. Um, after that, uh, we can move on to our migration into Kubernetes and how it basically kind of kind of supercharged um, or streamlined our um, Airflow deployment and our platform in general even. Um, and then next we'll go over how we kind of support the kind of dev to production life cycle um, for our data scientists um, and then some of the custom tooling and then the CICD pipelines and processes that we've put in place to enable our data scientists. Um, and then uh, we'll follow that up with a discussion around containerization in our platform, specifically um, some of the kind of customized operators that we've built to operate within within this kind of cloud native or uh, container native world even. And then we'll leave some time for Q&A. Uh, so kind of super quickly, um, this is our team or our org. Um, we sit within data strategy and operations org here at PlayStation. Um, our broader org manages several data initiatives across PlayStation. We centralize data um, into our Snowflake data warehouse, um, making it available for everything from um, analysis, reporting, to machine learning, um, everything that kind of enables PlayStation to be more data-driven. Uh, there's kind of several teams within the org that I've listed here. Uh, we have data engineers, we have analytics engineers, um, systems and infrastructure folks. Um, we have data governance and literacy. Uh, and then finally, at the end here, we have uh, a data science team. Um, and um, our data science team here helps basically um, different teams across PlayStation with data science needs. And we are the data science platform team um, within data science, and we own and manage the platform that the data scientists uh, use to do everything from, uh, from exploration to development to testing, releasing, and um, productionizing their machine learning models. A uh, brief history of our usage of Airflow. Uh, so um, we were undergoing what we called this tech refresh program around five years ago. Uh, at the time we were migrating from on-prem to the cloud. Um, and at the time our, our, our data scientists uh, were using an in-house Python application um, to manage their workflows that was written by some engineers who had long since left. Um, and this custom Python application was using Jenkins as kind of its scheduling bit. Uh, so as part of this tech refresh program, we underwent an initiative to explore tools in this space, which led us to Airflow. Um, at the time, um, and even kind of very much now, um, I think it's still far and away the best tool in the space. Uh, it's very feature rich, very customizable, uh, very well supported by the open source community. Um, and these were some of the kind of key reasons that we um, decided to choose it as pretty much the backbone of our platform. Um, to get it to work, we did a little bit of additional work. We um, initially forked Airflow internally. Um, I think it was like version 1.7 or 1.8 at that time. Um, we made a few changes uh, to, um, for it to support our needs, nothing too major though. 
Um, and then we also had to kind of do the dockerizing bit of it because there wasn't uh, an official Docker image at the time. Um, so we kind of created like uh, templates to do the configurations with. Um, we added the, the Java bits that we needed, added in our JDBCs for um, Presto and Snowflake. Um, and then lastly, we had to do the terraforming, um, which we had our systems and infrastructure engineers work on um, to basically stand up all the infrastructure um, underneath or on top of which we could deploy our Dockerized Airflow um, containers on top of. Um, what that led to was this uh, being kind of our original or initial setup, um, this EC2 based um, version on which our QA and prod environments both look like. Um, you can see that we have these EC2 instances here. Um, we have uh, an EFS that basically we used as our DAGs kind of directory or our DAG storage that attached across all the different nodes of our Airflow um, little cluster here. Um, and then that EFS uh, had DAGs deployed to it by Jenkins. Um, Jenkins would basically monitor for um, code getting pushed into GitHub DAG code plus the um, data scientists and uh, machine learning code. Um, and as uh, Jenkins uh, would see it, it would trigger some processes that would um, then deploy to the EFS and make the DAGs available. Uh, there's quite a bit of uh, stuff that's missing in this diagram. There's like auto scaling groups, load balancers, even like logs going to S3, things like that. Um, we kind of just wanted to focus on what was important for the sake of um, this presentation. Uh, so let's go to the dev setup. Um, this is slightly different. Uh, it makes things slightly more interesting, um, basically to allow our data scientists to develop DAGs um, and then run those DAGs as kind of workloads on Airflow. We uh, had this dev set up, um, which basically um, allowed, uh, gave our data scientists these AWS um, Cloud9 environments, which is this IDE that you can um, access through AWS. Um, and this cloud-based IDE, you can then mount this EFS to, which is a DAGs directory, um, which was also mounted to the dev um, cluster. Um, and then data scientists could basically go through and um, make code changes directly against the dev environment, um, which worked uh, worked to allow them to develop DAGs, but it had some of its own limitations, which we will discuss next. So um, general limitations across the entire platform, um, this with this original EC2 based setup. Um, first, all of the model training had to be done on EMR using Spark. Um, secondly, the workloads, um, they all ran on a particular underlying instance type. Um, the third issue was that everyone shared a single dev environment and it could get messy with people like stepping on each other, um, either stepping on each other or having to share resources um, or not deleting you know, old work um, that just created a big mess. Um, after that, the next issue was that not everyone was happy to use Cloud9. Um, for their DAG development. Um, some people wanted to use you know, PyCharm and other tools. Um, that was for the data scientists. For us engineers, we had our own kind of pain points, um, painful to manage. We had forked Airflow internally, like I mentioned. Um, we had our own Docker image that we had to uh, maintain. The Terraform was probably um, kind of the messiest part that we had to deal with. And then even the Cloud9 environments, we had to um, kind of manage for the data scientists. Then our CICD in particular, the way we deployed DAGs wasn't very clean at all. Um, it didn't scale well. The auto scaling groups, particularly for the workers, um, the, so we use Celery Executor. Um, for those workers, we had to, if we wanted to increase those, we had to manually go in and change the auto scaling groups in AWS to add more nodes or reduce them when the load got lighter, um, which wasn't ideal. Um, then also the Python package and library management was pretty messy as data scientists had to come to us um, and have us install new packages and then redeploy um, Airflow um, or EMR if we were installing them there. And then um, lastly, it was hard to deploy new tools that we built, the engineers built um, for our data scientists to use. Um, so how did we kind of get around all of these limitations? Um, well, we figured Kubernetes offered a lot of elegant solutions to some of um, these kind of previous limitations. Um, many people might find operating on Kubernetes to be kind of a bit more challenging, 
I think, but hopefully from the previous slide, I hope you guys see that Kubernetes really did solve a good bit of our problems that we had. Um, using Kubernetes, data scientists could now select their own libraries um, and they could also submit their workloads to run on a particular hardware of their choosing. Um, uh, we built tools to allow our data scientists to launch their own Airflow dev environments, which we'll talk about a bit more in the um, upcoming slides. Um, now the data scientists could choose to use whichever ID they wanted, whether it's PyCharm or something else. Um, for us data science platform engineers, um, it made it much easier to deploy Airflow and manage it. We could operate completely at the application level. We used the help chart, um, which is much easier than using the Terraform, um, which was kind of tightly coupled with the underlying infrastructure. Um, it scales much better because we can leave most of the scaling, all of the scaling basically up to Kubernetes. Um, the package and library dependency management um, before we had to manage that, but now data scientists could make those changes in their projects, Docker files, requirements, TXT files, or their poetry files. Um, and us engineers could much more easily push out new tools for data scientists to use as well. Um, to undergo kind of this migration into Kubernetes, it was kind of a three-phased process for us. Um, just because making these smaller incremental changes um, wouldn't cause any large disruptions really. Um, so in this first phase, everything looked pretty similar. Um, we were still using Airflow 1.10.10, which is what we were using at the time. Um, and we still had kind of these Celery Executor with these workers. Um, the main difference was down here, we had this Kubernetes cluster now into which we would deploy our containerized um, machine learning jobs. Um, and we were using the Airflow Kubernetes pod operator to do that. For phase two, which was kind of the more, um, kind of the more intense phase, I guess, um, we upgraded to Airflow 2.0 at this time, um, which brought about its own changes. And then on top of that, we switched from the Celery executor to the Kubernetes executor. Um, and then lastly, we started to, to deploy Airflow directly into um, EKS or Kubernetes and got off of the old um, kind of vanilla EC2 based approach that we used to use. And we used the Helm chart for um, accomplishing this. Um, then phase three here, this was basically, um, most of this was migrating off of EMR and into Spark on Kubernetes. And to do this, we developed this in-house Spark on Kubernetes airflow operator. Um, as part of this phase, we also removed an EFS that used to sit out here that you saw um, basically that was, this was the old approach with the EFS. Um, and we migrated to these Git sync sidecar deployments as part of that third phase also. Um, this old phase, I mentioned a little bit, it was pretty messy. Um, we basically, Jenkins would push these DAGs out to S3 or our artifact storage um, place. Um, and then it would trigger Airflow, a particular Airflow DAG, which would download all the other DAGs. Um, so it was kind of messy. It was hard to debug, it was slow. Um, so we moved it to this Git sync um, sidecar deployments that we did, which are much cleaner and much faster, much more elegant solution to deploy DAGs. Um, so as we moved into Kubernetes um, and into this kind of more this container native world, uh, there are some questions that we had to ask ourselves that we uh, were needed to evolve our platform. Um, some of those questions uh, I jogged down here so um, what additional tooling would we need to put in place to enable data scientists to do Airflow DAG development, as well as their machine learning code development and testing um, within a container native platform? Um, what does our CICD need to look like to allow our data scientists to kind of seamlessly go from development through QA and then into production? And then what additional operators would we need to build to kind of enable this um, to happen? And then the rest of this presentation will focus on how we answered these questions with the tools, the plumbing, and the processes that we put in place. And Hamed will take it from here to go over those areas with you guys. Cool. Uh, I hope you see my, my screen. So cool. Uh, so Basically, to design a platform, it's quite important to know your audience that you want to build something for it. There, therefore, we needed to consider uh, different requirements uh, 
for this platform and that is specially built for data scientists. The first one is that uh, uh, we need to provide a different levels of flexibility for the users per environment. And so in data science world, most of the data scientists spend a lot of their time uh, on ex um, exploring ideas and developing new solutions and validating existing or uh, new algorithms. So it is quite important to, to, to have a higher level of flexibility in, in this dev environment uh, so that they can explore their idea uh, more freely without any kind of uh, hard uh, limitation. On the other hand, we want to have more control when it comes to production and uh, passing the development area. And we want to put some restrictions into the place. Uh, the other requirement was that uh, the isolations of uh, this data, uh, this development uh, environment. So the data scientist needs the freedom and confidence that nobody else is actually impacting their work uh, unexpectedly or vice versa. So it's important that uh, their environment is very similar to uh, what they see in production so that uh, they don't have to deal with uh, different environment. Uh, so for that purpose, we uh, we designed basically a, a kind of sandbox uh, in development where they have their own personal airflow, so everybody could just launch their own airflow, and they have their personal uh, Snowflake database, which uh, which is our basically base data backend for data scientists, and the ability to basically uh, run code into the platform using any on-demand resources that that are available. So, and the third, uh, the third basically requirement was that uh, we need to do seamless transition from development to production, in a sense that uh, the code, as I said, that that's uh, developed or uh, changed in development, it has to be uh, work scheduling in production. Uh, that will, with that, we make sure that uh, uh, the the changes that goes to production is is seamless and it reduces basically the time to release new changes or in the sense of uh, bug fixes is really helped to, to speed up the, uh, the delivery time uh, for that uh, change. So uh, to basically based on those requirements, uh, we started to designing tools and processes around this, uh, the airflow and the setup, uh, so that it helps basically our end user, which are our data scientists. So, we built some REST API and CLI, which I'll explain in a bit, uh, to simplify the interaction with the platform. We also built different dashboards for, for them to basically monitor the performance of their, uh, their jobs, uh, the code that runs in the platform, and also the custom metrics that they could define and, and monitor. Uh, and then as part of the transition from there to production, we also built some CI-CD process to to help promote the Airflow DAX from development uh, to production. So talking about that uh, custom tools, uh, part of creating a pleasant experience for the user is to hide the complexity of things that they actually don't need to know. And in this, this sense, we build everything on top of Kubernetes and data scientists, uh, they don't actually need to know and have the expertise about Kubernetes. And, they need to focus on what uh, they have to do and innovate uh, on their space. While we in the platform side, we build uh, things on top of uh, everything and then simplify that. So for that, we build a kind of REST API and then uh, a CLI that will be handed to the uh, each data scientist and they will actually interact with the platform with this command line tool. So this command line tool then uh, it will uh, basically offer different uh, functionalities to them. Uh, they can they can create their own airflow basically behind the scene. You know, when somebody creates an airflow, it just uh, we we use those uh, Helm charts to deploy airflow. We render those based on the user uh, specific information, and then uh, comes up that uh, brings us up that uh, airflow instance and. People can basically create their airflow. They can remove it, manage database, etc., through the, the commands. 
also as part of running things on on the platform we also uh, give the, the the options for the uh, users to basically build docker images in the platform and then uh, basically build all those uh, python libraries that they want uh, and then they can use those images basically to submit uh, various different types of jobs from non uh, spark job to to spark distributed jobs and then through those jobs basically they can actually select uh, what type of uh, uh, nodes and compute they can uh, they want their their basically jobs run on and then uh, yeah they can actually uh, freely test their idea they can also manage their own basically uh, code storage that we gave them and they can which are basically connect back to all these uh, tools uh comes to the ci cd as i said the development tool it doesn't necessarily need to be in git it could be developed locally and test in the platform and then but uh, uh since we want to productionize this uh they're uh, basically airflow dags at the end we want to basically have a capability for them to transition from development to production and those ci cd that we built uh was actually helping them to to do uh, different things, for example, building those Docker images through the CI CD pipelines, and then they can basically run tests on DAGs, define basically uh, different pre commit tools uh, to apply on those codes that they, write, uh, they wrote. And then at the end, they could deploy those DAGs to production. Here is one simple example of a, a simple uh, pipeline where uh, in this repository you have for example two DAGs which uh, I want to run this lint on top of the codes and then uh, in the DAG one I'm running uh, Pythos uh, on, on the code that I want and then in the second one I'm building uh, two different Docker images for two different purposes and then at the end it will basically deploy those DAGs to production. This is the, the overview of uh, how the setup looks like. So in the development, as I said, we have the DSDSDML tool, which uh, gives the user uh, the ability to interact. Uh, we have a sort of Jupyter Hub as well as, as also another tool that they could actually uh, open up and uh, explore uh, different ideas. It's also um, actually equipped with all those kind of uh, supports uh, with respect to dependency management tools, uh, et cetera. Uh, as I said, they could build images, run the code uh, as in standalone jobs or uh, Spark jobs into the platform. They could <clears throat> interact with their own Airflow, uh, and the Airflow could basically, through operators, uh, uh, trigger those jobs and Spark jobs. And as I said, they could interact with their own uh, storage as well. Once, once this development phase basically done, uh, they are pushing those codes to Git, and then the CI CD pipelines that we built will take care of uh, building Docker images, running uh, all sort of things that needs to be done. And then at the end, it will deploy to the right area, uh, uh, in the right environment that we have. Uh, cool. Then let's talk about how we, we basically manage our Airflow DAX codes. So we started basically to have just one repositories and all of our DAGs was sitting on that repository. That was a very large, humongous, uh, basically, repository we had. Uh, we started to think about how we could actually improve uh, that process. And uh, uh, that single process has some pros and cons to it. So on the pros cons, uh, it is easier really to manage and deploy this because it's just one repo. Uh, and then it's easier to do both changes on the same repo uh, and then do one change changes at, at the same time uh, but on the con side and the negative side it's mostly impacting the users that uh, we have a huge commit history uh, and it's quite hard for the user to go back and uh, basically track the changes with respect to project DAGs etc uh, there was also lack of custom control uh, per maybe tools or projects or DAGs specifically uh, when we have just one repo uh, in place uh, there was also some problems between teams, the multiple teams in the same repo, they were basically interfering with each other in terms of conflicting on the code, etc. 
uh, and also there was no way to basically have other artifacts uh, uh, in that repository other than those stacks. So we started to explore, uh, uh, basically transition to another uh, way of basically handling those codes. And uh, through that, we kind of start to analyzing well, how the multi repository will look like uh, if we want to go through that route. So on the pros side, uh, it's kind of flipping over. So on the pros, uh, it, we would have a better Git history, cleaner Git history, because it's, it would be a, a more a number of repository per project, and then those codes are related to the project. And uh, it's, it's also uh, have the ability to define the custom uh, config per repository, where, for example, you define rules for your merge request, templating, et cetera, et cetera. On the con side, so again, we have to manage all these scatter uh, repositories uh, around. So we have to somehow um, make them deploy into uh, Airflow at the end. And also bulk changes to different repositories is another uh, kind of challenge. So we thought about it and then uh, we thought that we could actually build something and uh, around it so that we could actually mitigate those cons so that at the end we would have uh, with this new approach, we would have a better experience to be with it. Some of the requirements of having and moving to this multi-repo was that uh, we need to uh, have a, a kind of a, a slow transition. And while keeping those one single repo, we, we start to keep, in, keep adding those new repos and try to uh, move off of that uh, one repo. So altogether, that has to be supported. Uh, then we had to build this CI CD to deploy all these DAGs into Airflow, uh, which was also another thing we need to do. Uh, also, with both changes, uh, we figured out that there, we could actually use a tool called Meta, where you can actually push both changes to multiple repo at the same time, which solves one of our problems. Uh, and also, uh, it's easier to, uh, to create, a, and we need to basically create some templates for those repos, which has all the necessary things for the users in terms of CI, CD, et cetera, logics and structures so that they can actually easily um, basically add them to, to the new, uh, add the new uh, repositories to the mix. And then uh, the ability to keep other codes than just Airflow is just another thing that we want to have as well. And also it has to have no impact on our current uh, development environment, which is good. Uh, how we did that, so each repository that we defined was uh, was a project that contains multiple DAGs, and then uh, uh, those DAGs will basically, uh, uh, through a CI CD pipeline which we built in Jenkins, then it will, they will get basically aggregated into one repo, and then that one repo ultimately sync uh, into the right uh, airflow component in, in, the, in production through the GitSync cycle. Uh, we also, as part of the CICD, we were building the image in a more meaningful way where uh, by looking at that image, you could understand that where this image is coming from, which repository, which tag, etc. And you can just point back to the Docker image, even the Docker like, file that that image is actually built based on. Uh, we also added the tags. Uh, we use this tagging. Uh, feature that Airflow added at some point so that we could add this repository tag to the to each tag. And then when we go to the UI, we could actually uh, filter uh, nicely based on the repository and project. Uh, let's talk about containers uh, and why we actually move, uh, move to containerizations. Um, so as Siraj was uh, explaining, all our data processing at some point and machine learning tasks was uh, was running on one EMR cluster. So, uh, and it was just running through uh, Airflow and uh, a custom Libby operator in the Airflow. Uh, uh, at some point, so this, this basically workloads contains both non-Spark and Spark uh, workloads. On the Spark workload was running on the EMR uh, and the non-Spark board was running on the master node on the EMR clusters. So uh, there were some issues with the uh, EMR itself. Uh, we had some scaling up uh, issues uh, that was slow as well. Uh, there was less flexibility to choose the underlying nodes and, uh, and uh, the nodes that we want to actually use. 
Uh, it was also a shared environment that uh, all the workloads was running on that infrastructure. And then that was actually uh, causing some issues when we were running uh, a lot of basically sports at the same time. Uh, it was also for the user, it was a lack of flexibility in the sense that we couldn't actually change easily uh, the libraries that we want to have in the cluster and also change the version, specific version of the library. Uh, and then it was not actually integrating actually with our uh, tools that we built in the platform. Also on the non-Spark uh, workload, uh, as I said, it was running on the master node on the EMR cluster, which all those basically negatives were impacting those types of job. Uh, another option was to run on, on the FA itself as a Python maybe operator, where uh, again, some other negatives around it that uh, user were not able to basically change the or use uh, uh, the, the libraries they want. So well, we decided to move off to the Kubernetes and then run the, the Kubernetes operator so that it, every basically non-smart task will run uh, on the Kubernetes itself. Uh, what are the benefits of uh, having containers and running containers? Uh, it actually separates the application and infrastructure in the, in the platform. So if we move to Kubernetes, we didn't have to deal with the, all the infrastructure bits and we will just focus on the deployment of the airflow itself. We, we focus on building basically tools for user to, to have, uh, uh, to basically, uh, improve the user experience uh it also helps uh helps us to uh to basically for the user as well to choose the, the libraries that they want they could actually build uh, any python libraries they want into the image then they can actually uh, uh, run any code they want uh, it also allows us to introduce a new uh more modern uh, python dependency management tools like poetry for example um, alongside with the other tools that we, use, we were using. Uh, it also provides some resource isolation for those tasks when they are running. Uh, we have a degree of isolation in Kubernetes uh, in terms of resources. Um, and then it also pro provide us with a unified way to run various types of terms. Uh, we can run both Spark and non-Spark at the same time in, in, in the Kubernetes. The other uh, basically benefit was that people and users can actually uh, run those uh, workloads according to what they need, and they can actually trigger different types of inst instances and run those workloads on those uh, instances. And as I said, Kubernetes uh, was helping us. Uh, how did we do that? We basically, for the non-Spark workload, uh, uh, we started to use basically uh, the the official Kubernetes pod operator. We extended this uh, pod operator to basically hide uh, those configuration that we need for our, uh, basically, uh, Airflow itself, uh, as well as Kubernetes, for example, mounting volumes, secret, uh, uh, and variables, and environment variables that we need to pass through. So, and then that operator will, will basically uh, run those uh, uh, tasks for us and then, in here. Uh, so in the in the operator itself, uh, you could see that we were uh, there were some parameters the user could pass. They could actually run uh, uh, the Python command with the path uh, of the code that they want to run. This path is, uh, as I said, one of the requirement was that uh, it doesn't change from development to production. So in development, we were mounting those that it was basically. EFS volumes to the code and the path would be the same. And then we will, when we basically build the images, we will build to the same path so that it will be uh, diff, uh, same uh, in, er, in every environment. They pass the image, uh, Docker image that they built uh, through uh, either the platform or the CRCD. Uh, they can pass the end variables, uh, uh, maybe on uh, those basically parameters that need to be passed on the right time. They can pass it through end uh, They can actually set up, uh, basically configure the uh, the resources that they want to assign to the job, and then they can also uh, uh, specify what type of node or which node they want to they want this job basically to run on, which is quite important when you run uh, different types of machine learning uh, tasks. Uh, 
With respect to Spark workload, uh, we move on to running Spark on Kubernetes. The advantage of running Spark on Kubernetes is that scaling is much faster and easier because it's down to Kubernetes and uh, Kubernetes is doing a great job on that. Uh, no more shared resources, uh, uh, unlike uh, EMR, and then people, as I said, could add or remove their uh, any Python machine learning libraries, bake it into a Docker image, and then uh, run that Spark job. And then uh, they integrate nicely into uh, our DS PML tool, which we design, and Basically, users, if they don't want to submit things to Airflow, they can do that outside uh, uh, outside the Airflow using the DSPML. It also gives us better monitoring uh, of the jobs and resource utilizations of each job that runs through our dashboards in uh, Datadog. Uh, and conceptually, it's very similar to Kubernetes operators. So for the user, it will be uh, much, much simpler and easier to follow. and use the same operator, different operator, but with the same logic. And uh, cost of infrastructure as well. Uh, and also, how did we do that? We basically rewrote uh, a new operator, Airflow operator, where uh, it is actually, uh, the goal is to submit in Spark jobs. So it is basically based on the Spark on Kubernetes operator uh, CRDs in Kubernetes, where uh, it is actually trying to submit uh, uh, translate basically some uh, uh, parameters to the uh, YAML file and then submit it as, as a job. So the operator that we design basically uh, implemented, it is actually simplified through uh, passing some parameters in Python. The user doesn't need to deal with uh, YAMLs, uh, etc. So they pass the same way that they do with the Kubernetes operator, they pass some uh, Python parameters. So behind the scene, the implementation is mostly about uh, uh, the, the logic with respect to the job. So it's just wait for the jobs uh, after submission. It managed manage, manage the error handling of the, the jobs. It also retrieved the logs from the driver pod that runs when the Kubernetes job is, uh, is running. It also gives us, uh, the user the ability to delete uh, Spark jobs and uh, also, out of the box, it's also uh, provide uh, the capability to handling uh, the Kubernetes uh, resources, so they can actually uh, define volumes, config map the same way they do with the uh, uh, Kubernetes operator. And this is an example of the the operator, so people can uh, can define all these Kubernetes resources. If you have volume you want to attach to to your Airflow Spark job, you can do that. Uh, if you want to basically read some config map or secret to the end variables, you can you can do that. Or you can mount a config map into a certain basically location if if you need into your job. And then uh, within the operator itself, uh, you can configure all these settings. Plus, uh, you pass the, the basically the path to your Spark code, and then the images plus all the runtime uh, uh, variables. And then out of the box is also supports the dynamic allocation that Spark also supports, where it just uh, dynamically could basically uh, allocate resources and create uh, executors uh, as well. Uh, it also manually can uh, can uh, basically can user basically can pass resources manually as well. So we are working towards basically contributing back to, to this to the airflow and hopefully at some point this will be part of the, the airflow as well. With that said, I think that's uh, the end of uh, the presentation.